All right, this morning I am preaching on the Bible uh, being our final authority in all matters of faith and practice. You might have uh, heard that word, uh, or sorry, that phrase uh, when Christians talk about their beliefs and uh, what's common amongst churches that hold to the Bible, you know, Bible-believing churches, the highest authority in the church is, is the Bible. It's our final authority in all matters of faith and practice. So we focus on the scriptures here in 2 Timothy 3. It says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. And then he goes on to say this about the scriptures. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And that word inspiration is not the word that you would think of when you think of inspiration, like you have like somebody you look up to and they inspire you to do something and it's sort of like they just have an influence over what you do. Inspiration in the Bible is talking about actually being breathed by God, spoken by God, right? All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Uh, as the Bible says, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. You see, the Bible gives us everything we need to know. That's why if you follow the Bible, it's everything you need to know in order that you may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works, not some good works. There's not something that we're missing in the Bible. Right? Like some people think that there are still extra revelations going on and God still is speaking prophetically through people. No, we have the whole Bible now. It's been closed off and we have everything we need to know. Something really interesting about this verse that I always point out is this category is a thing. It's profitable for doctrine. It teaches you what is right for reproof. It teaches you what is wrong for correction. It teaches you how to make it right for instruction in righteousness, how to keep it right. Right? So you can see what is right, what is wrong, how to correct it, how to make it right, how to keep it right. This is what the Bible gives us. And all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now what does it mean to have the Bible as your final authority? Now that, it doesn't mean that everything we do or don't do is mentioned in the Bible. You know, some people get this idea, it's like, oh, if it's not mentioned in the Bible, you shouldn't do it, only if it's mentioned in the Bible. There's plenty of things we do in life that are not mentioned in the Bible. It requires some judgment, right? So what it means when the Bible is the final authority in all matters of faith and practice is that the Bible, in everything we do, we must be guided by the principles in the Bible as opposed to something else. So what that does mean, if the Bible is our final authority in all matters of faith and practice, what it does mean is that if there's something we do that is contrary to the Bible, then that needs to change. Right? So we need to align with the commandments and principles that are given in, our, in the Bible. And that's the final authority. It's the highest authority uh, in our life. Right? It's not the only authority in our life because we have tiers of authority, but the highest authority is the Word of God. Now you see here that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And the principle we can gather from here is that because all Scripture is in, given by inspiration of God, all of it is perfect. All of it must harmonize. And this is why when we think about how we understand Scripture, right, what's the best way to try and understand Scripture? Well, on any given topic, you need to look at where, what the Bible says on that topic, and then you need to have a, a position or an understanding or an interpretation of those passages that can consistently explain all these verses, right? So you have to take the Bible as a whole. Oftentimes people will take isolated passages and they'll you know, have a verse that fits their doctrine, but does it fit all the passages that would be relevant to that topic, right? So the assumption here is that the word is perfect. There's no contradiction. Therefore, it must all harmonize and fit together and be consistent. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And not only that, if you see the Bible says here, 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God. So notice, to know the Bible, it's going to take some study. Right, you're kidding yourself if you think, I come to church once a week or once every now and then, and that's going to give me a good understanding of the Bible. Right, that's like saying, you know, if I go out and eat once a week, I'm going to get a good diet, I'm going to get fed, I'm going to have nutrition. Right, so don't uh, kid yourself 
and think that I'm growing as a Christian and I'm growing in my knowledge when the only Bible you get is once a week, right? Or even less than that if you're not consistent at church. You need to be studying the Word, reading the Word, right? It needs to be part of your life as you talk about it. And, and the more it's a part of your life, you know, it's a part of your children's life as well. You know, you don't want it to be like something you just do on Sunday. You know, and Sunday is when I turn into Christian mode. Right? You want to be a Christian, it's a lifestyle, right? So if your life is as a Christian, it's going to naturally infuse in all areas of your life, and that's what you want. Right? Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, right? Because it's a shameful thing as a Christian to not know your Bible, right? Rightly dividing the word of truth, right? So there are divisions in the Bible that you, you divide between, like not physically, it's one book, but it's like there are concepts in the Bible that must be differentiated, right? So one is you have like New Testament and Old Testament books, right? So you got books, that, so New Testament books are ones that were written, you know, you know, after Jesus rose again, and then you have Old Testament books, the ones that were written prior to Jesus coming. But you don't want to confuse that with, even though we call them New Testament books and Old Testament books, you don't want to confuse that with the New Testament, which started when Jesus died and rose again, and the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, which was the works covenant that we see throughout the Old Testament and even alluded to in the New Testament. Because why? Because when Jesus lived on the earth, he was still technically under the Old Covenant, right? It wasn't until he died and rose again that the New Covenant began. So that's why when you're, even though you're reading New Testament books, you are reading still in the Gospels at a time when the Old Testament is still in effect. And that's why they talk about Sabbaths. That's why they talk about sacrifices and all those sorts of things. This is still going on at that time. Then you have like New Testament, Old Testament ordinances, different practices, some that have ceased, and new ones that are for the New Testament, like communion and baptism. Um, well, another way as well you rightly divide the word of truth is you need to differentiate between statements and stories, right? So you never want to build a doctrine on a story that contradicts a statement. And a lot of people do that. A lot of people will find, you'll, you know, when they try to support their doctrine, they'll go to like a parable or they go to like some story, but it's contradictive of the clear statements. You know, how many times do people use parables to teach work salvation and yet Ephesians 2 8, the clear statement says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And we also have to d differentiate between the difference between a precedent versus a commandment. So, what's that? That's something you see done in the Bible versus something that is commanded in the Bible, right? So, that's uh, a differentiation and a distinction that helps as well. And these sort of distinctions and differentiations help us to better determine sound doctrine and understand the Word of God, right? And we need to understand it if we want to apply it and make it the final authority in our life. Now, that is how you have the Bible as the final authority. What I want to talk about today, I want to give you eight ways where people do not make the Bible the final authority in their lives, right? They make other things the authority in their lives, and sometimes these things will supersede people's decision-making when they do things, rather than having the Bible as our final authority in all matters of faith and practice. All right, number one is emotions. Emotions. What is emotions? Emotions is how something makes you feel. And this will often manifest in Christians' lives when you hear them say things like, I have peace about it. I have peace about it. Oh, you're moving you know, out to, you know, another city, and you don't know what church you're going to go to, you don't know what, you know, you don't know if there's even a good church there, but you need to move there for a job or whatnot. Yeah, but, but I have peace about it. I have peace about it. That's them going by how they feel, not what God wants us to do, right? He wants us to make sure that we are congregating amongst God's people, and sometimes people move for financial reasons, for career reasons, and they do not even consider their final authority, right? Which is giving them principles. Say, hey, you need to make sure you're fellowshipping with God's people. You have somewhere to serve. You need to be part of the body of Christ. But yet sometimes people leave that body for the wrong reasons. That's just one example. Look what the Bible says about emotion, like trusting your own heart. That's all we can think about when we put emotions above the Word of God. Proverbs 28, 26. He that trusteth his own heart, in his own heart, look at this, is a fool. Whoso walketh wisely, he shall be delivered 
famous verse in Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? See, why would you want to trust what a desperately wicked thing feels? Right? That's why your heart needs to be guided by the Word of God. You don't judge the Word of God by how you feel about it. Okay, so this is what it means to not put your emotions above the Word of God. Look at what Hebrews 11.25 says. Choosing, this is talking about Moses, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God, look at this, than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. See, if you just go by how you feel, you know sin feels good? You know, sin can, might give you peace in the short term, Right? But you don't go by what feels good because sometimes what is wrong feels good as well, feels right, can give you peace. Right? That's why the Bible talks about the wisdom that descends from above. It's first pure, then peaceable. Right? You need peace through the truth, not peace regardless of the truth, right? just because of your emotions. Okay, so you don't want your emotions to be an authority above the Word of God. What's another way people have something other, something else other than the Bible as their final authority. Well, number two is an experience. An experience. Or like a spiritual encounter, right? This often happens in the Pentecostal church, right? But it happens in false churches too, like the Mormons, you know, they talk about the burning in the bosom, right? Pentecostals will talk about maybe they had a vision, maybe they they, they went to a, a thing and they're speaking in tongues, right? Something came over them and they're like rolling on the floor and foaming at the mouth and you know, giggling and whatnot. And they said, like, oh, but I felt it. Something, something happened. But it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what, to them like what the Bible says about speaking in tongues and you shouldn't do it. Like, you know, when nobody understands you and if you speak in tongues, you need an interpreter. And, you know, it's, and it's not for the unbelievers, the Bible talks about, where you know, they say, oh, look at these miracles that's happening and people can believe that God's working here. Well, why does the Bible say that tongue, tongues are for those that believe, right? Not for the unbelievers. Because unbelievers will just think you're crazy, the Bible says. So that's an example where sometimes... Now, am I discounting that miracles happen? No. I'm not saying that miracles... I'm not saying that visions and miracles don't happen but they should never, ever be put above the Word of God. The Word of God is our final authority in all matters of faith. How do you even know if that vision or that spiritual encounter that you had was of God? Because you know it's possible that miracle workers and things like this can be not of God. They can be of demonic influences, right? Look at what Deuteronomy 13 says. It says, if there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and giveth thee a sign or a wonder. Right? So here's a sign or a wonder. So he's like saying, this is going to happen, some miracle, he does some miracle. Look, and the sign or the wonder come to pass. So it actually happens. Whereof he spake unto thee, saying, let us go after other gods, which thou hast not known. So here's a false prophet doing a miracle. And let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God proveth you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Isn't that interesting? Because sometimes people have this experience and they're so drawn to it, they think, oh, it makes me love God so much. But if it pushes you away from the Word of God, makes you do something that's not in the Word of God, God's actually testing to see, do you really love God? Because the proof of whether you love God is whether you love His Word. Remember, the Word was with God. The Word was God. Right? So whether you love God or not, it's going to determine whether you love His Word. And here he's saying, even when a false prophet does something, it's proving to see whether you actually do love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. Because you're not just being taken away from this experience that you had, this miracle. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear Him and keep His commandments and obey His voice. And you shall serve Him and cleave unto Him. And that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he hath spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of bondage to thrust thee out of the way which the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk in. So shalt thou put the evil away from the midst of thee. Look at what it says in Matthew 7. We always talk about this verse when it comes to people thinking they can work their way to heaven. But notice, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, 
have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils. Have you ever heard somebody say, well, they must be of God. Look at the devils that they cast out. And in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So in Deuteronomy 13, we see false prophets doing miracles. Here we see unsaved people doing, casting out demons. I mean, you probably think that was miraculous, right? Casting out demons, and yet they're not saved. Jesus doesn't even know them. He said, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. You want to think about a spiritual experience. Look at, look at this in uh, 2 Peter 1. This is Peter talking about his experience on the Mount of Transfiguration. Do you remember when he took up, you know, Peter, James and John, and then they saw Jesus transfigured, and Peter said, hey, let's make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And he saw that with his own eyes. But look at what he says about this experience. He says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honour and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And remember, that's what was said on the Mount Transfiguration. And this voice which came from heaven, we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. But verse 19, look at this. But we have also a more sure word of prophecy. A more sure word of prophecy. You say, Peter, a more sure word of prophecy than what you saw with your own eyes and what you heard with your own ears? Yes. A more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well, that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. So you see, that's the more sure word of prophecy. It's a prophecy of Scripture, right? The written, the Word of God is any of private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. There's that verse I was referring to when we talked about all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. So some people, they hold an experience. I'm not saying that spiritual encounters don't happen. I'm not saying that these experiences don't happen, but they are not our final authority in all matters of faith and practice. You never put an experience above what the Word of God teaches. And uh, a lot of Pentecostals do that, unfortunately. Um, number three, tradition. Tradition. Tradition is not our final authority in all matters of faith and practice, right? The Bible is. What is tradition? I mean, tradition is practices that are passed down. Sometimes people have a tradition, and why do they do it? Well, it's just because that's what we've always done. You know, businesses sometimes fall into these traps where, why do you do that? Well, we do that because that's just what we've always done. And happens in the Christian life too when it comes to, say, like Christmas and Easter traditions. Like I talk about these traditions sometimes at those times of the year where Christians go, well, why, do you put on, you know, why do you put on the Santa outfit and dress all your kids in elves and get, you know, buy the chocolate bunnies and chocolate eggs and celebrate Easter like these pagan things that have nothing to do with the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, it's because that's what we've always done. Isn't that what Christians do? Isn't that what Christians Well, you can see that... You know, there are good traditions and there are bad traditions, right? It reminds me, have you ever heard that story of the, the monkeys in the room? When people, there's often an illustration that is taught when people talk about like bad, tradi like bad tradition. Like people, they just do things without even knowing why it's done. Basically, what they do is they put all these monkeys into a room. I don't know if they really do this experiment, but this is just how the story goes. They put all these monkeys into a room. There's a pole climbing up to the upper room and there's like a bunch of bananas up there. But every time a monkey climb, tries to climb up the pole to get to the bananas, they like blast the monkey with like cold water, right? And every monkey tries to go up, they all get blasted with cold water, so they, they, they're a bit cautious about going up this pole. So then what do they do? They then introduce a new monkey into that room, and that monkey immediately tries to climb up the pole, but because all the other monkeys know that they got blasted with water, they, they like pull the monkey down, don't let him climb up the pole, right, to get the bananas. And they just keep taking one monkey out, putting a new monkey in, and they just keep pulling the monkey down, not letting him go up and get those monkeys, until they replace all the monkeys that were blasted with the water, and there's only monkeys now that are just pulling the monkeys down from not going up to the upper room 
because that's just what everyone else was doing. Right? And they use that illustration to sort of teach us, you know, like, don't be those monkeys where you're just not even thinking about why you can't go up there. You're just doing it because everyone else is doing it. That's why, that's, why, that's an illustration that people talk about. And you'll probably, if you come across sort of business talks and whatnot, that illustration is always used. Monkeys going up, you know, trying to get there and the other monkeys pulling them down. Um, sometimes it's used to talk about discouraging people as well. Like sometimes just people just keep discouraging people and pulling them down, and that's just because everyone else is doing it, right? It's like the tall poppy syndrome. Now, not all traditions are bad. I mean, all, inevitably, Christianity is a tradition, right? I mean, everything we do has been passed down. Scriptures have been passed down, the practices, but through God's word, right? So tradition in and of itself is not a bad thing. Second Thessalonians 2, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistles. So notice that these are good traditions, right? Traditions that are founded on God's word, guided by God's word. Sometimes you have traditions that, you know, not necessarily in the Bible, they're not necessarily bad, right? They can have, you know, good spiritual meaning. You know, tradition is not bad in and of itself. But when is a tradition bad? Well, let's look at Matthew 15, verse 1. Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, it is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honour not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Ye hypocrites, well did his eyes prophesy of you, saying, this people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoureth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So when does a tradition become a bad thing? It's when it makes you make the word of God of none effect. Right? And we're talking about Christmas and Easter. You know, like sometimes people, you know, they're so into celebrating Jesus on Easter and Christmas that they don't even go to church on Christmas and Easter. Now, usually Christmas and Easter is like when our church as well has the lowest uh, attendance. And that ought not be so. I mean, how can, a, how can an event, how can a holiday that is meant to honour the Lord Jesus Christ and then churches all around the country have less people going to church. Is that not making the, the commandment of God of none effect by our tradition? In our tradition to celebrate this holiday that supposedly you know, is putting God up, but yet we just totally neglect what he actually wants us to do in his word? So this is, one, this is when a tradition is no good, right? And the tradition may not be bad in and of itself. But you can see here, I mean, was there anything wrong with washing of the pots and things. But see, sometimes a tradition is bad because it, it makes you feel justified in yourself that you're doing something spiritual and then neglecting what is actually commanded, right? Which is what is happening here. They're doing these things, thinking they're spiritual, following the tradition of their elders and their fathers, but then they make the word of God and not effect, meaning they feel spiritual doing this, but they're not actually doing what God has commanded them, right? Let's go on. So tradition. A lot of people hold tradition higher than uh, the Word of God. Number four, we can talk about isolated verses. Remember we talked about in the beginning, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And this one's a bit tricky because people sometimes think, oh, I've got a verse, right, to, to support my view. But if it's just a verse and it contradicts the rest of Scripture, do you really have... The Bible, right? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God is your final authority in all matters of faith and practice. Now, a good example of this. So when we talk about, you know, the important doctrine of, you know, work salvation, right? When people don't take the whole Bible into account and try and make it consistent, work salvation, obviously, is always tried to promote. They've got their verses. This is one of them, James 2. I'm sure you've heard this so many times when you talk about salvation by grace with people. James 2 says, but wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Now say, so see, works salvation. I'm just using this one as an example. But, you know, if we take the whole Bible into account and even we compare it with Romans 4, 
Where is he saying that Abraham was justified by works? When he offered to Isaac his son upon the altar. So this is the quick answer to James 2. But look at Romans 4. Romans 4 is a very good comparison with James 2 because it talks about Abraham and it touches on the same topics, right? From a different angle. Romans 4. What shall we say then that Abraham our father is pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. So you see there how he's justified by works in James 2, but in Romans 4 it's saying, hey, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. So what does that tell you? That tells you that James 2 is talking about in the eyes of men, right? We see Abraham's faith, but in the eyes of God, his works do not justify him in the eyes of God. It's only his faith, right? God can see his faith. For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward, not reckoned of grace, but of debt. So saying if you work for something, you're not getting it for free, you actually owed it. It's like we tell people, like if you work for your boss, and then he says, oh, here's a gift for you, here's your salary. You're going to be like, I worked for this, it's not a gift. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also described it, the blessedness of the man under whom God imputeth righteousness without works. And I always find it interesting because here's the description of a dead faith, right? Faith without works is dead, and yet it's salvation. Why? Because whether or not you add works to your faith or not does not determine whether or not you're saved. But what it does, it'll be profitable to somebody else, like it talks about in James 2. Saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin, Cometh this blessedness, it's talking about salvation, then upon the circumcision only, upon the uncircumcision also, it's saying, is it only for those that are circumcised? No, for we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. Why? Because Abraham was saved by grace through faith. Verse 10, how was it then reckoned? How did, how did he get it? In what state? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? So was Abraham circumcised or uncircumcised when he believed on God and it was counted him for righteousness? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had, yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. So you can see here, it's very clear, Romans 4, he's not glorying before God because of his works, and also he was saved many decades before he offered his son Isaac upon the altar, because he was saved even before he was circumcised. And if you know Abraham's timeline, I preach a whole sermon on this, but, you know, because he, he obviously gets circumcision, then he has Ishmael, then he has Isaac, and then Isaac goes up onto the mountain with him. That's when he sacrifices Isaac, you know, which he, he starts to. So many, many years later, Abraham's already saved. And that's the point of Romans 4. So we know that James 2, if we use it as an isolated verse, rather than all scripture being our final authority in all matters of faith and practice, we can be led astray. So we don't want isolated verses to be our final authority. We want a, a whole Bible, all verses, consistently understood with the right distinctions. Number five is an interesting one. Number five is going to a foreign language, right? Going to a foreign language. And this is what you see in churches where they're going back to the Greek, going back to the Greek. Now we have the Bible in English. We have a perfect English translation. They will say the same thing. And people that speak Greek and people that know Greek, they say, yeah, well, they're generally describing the same thing. I mean, every time like I've sat in a sermon and somebody has gone back to the Greek, either they have described exactly what it says on the page, right? Or like a synonym of it, because obviously English words can have synonyms as well. Or they describe something that is not there on the page. And that's the danger of going you know, back to the Greek. When you start hearing preachers saying, well, that's what the Bible says, but in the Greek, what it really means, and then they just make it mean something completely different. right? And many people do that. And why? Because what happens is, you know, a lot of these preachers that go back to the Greek, and even like you're studying yourself, like a lot of these people don't actually speak Greek, and they don't actually speak Greek like the ancient Greek. You know, even though you speak Greek today, it not necessarily means the words are used in the same way, because even English, you know, you think about English, how it's used between different countries. Imagine what, what can change over 2,000 years, the usage of words, right, and all that. So it's, it's, not, it's not an exact science language, but what most people are doing when they play this Greek game is just looking up a word in the Bible, 
And then they just look it up in a Greek dictionary. And then obviously in a dictionary, you're just given like multiple options. And then they just think, oh, it could mean any of these. Oh, it means, oh, I'm getting insight into the word of God. But I mean, you can't even do that with English words, right? In English, you can't just look up a word in English and just say, there's five different meanings and just go, oh, yeah, this sentence, it just might just mean... But that's sometimes what they do, you know? They just do that, and then they sound all smart, saying, oh, in the Greek, it means this. But really, all they're doing is they're just changing the Word of God, right? So we want the Word of God to be our final authority. We don't want a dictionary being our final authority, right? Because that dictionary and its meanings are not inspired, right? But the Bible is inspired, right? So we don't want to go to a foreign language. And sometimes people get this idea. They say, well, but, you know... Nah, sometimes you just, you know, words just can't be translated into English. But to me, that doesn't make sense because every time somebody said that to me, they say, like, because generally when people say that, it means, like, they don't know the English language well enough to know the words that would explain that word. Because often what happens, in my experience, is people say, you know, that word doesn't really have a word in English, but it means, and then they go on to explain what it means in English. But it's like, but if it didn't have a word to explain it in English, how did you just explain it to me in English? Right? So obviously the word exists because you can explain it to me. So think about this. If you could not translate from language perfectly, how is somebody ever meant to learn another language? Because you know when you learn another language, that's what you're doing. You're finding equivalent words. And, and that means if you cannot, if you never get the real meaning because you weren't like native speaker, well then how did, how did anyone learn that language? Right? Because you have to be able to, 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 to know that language. You, you, you first have to, you, you have to translate it to yourself. Right? So this idea that God's word can't be translated, and obviously, you know, I, I believe the Holy Spirit had a play in translating the word of God, and this is where we you know, believe that you know, God had a hand in translating it. That's why we believe the King James Version is perfect. It's a belief, right? But it's something that's not irrational. Right? Just like God existing is a belief, but it's not irrational because we can say, look, Life comes from life, it's created a designer, things like that. So it's a rational belief. So people are always correcting the word of God. And the thing is, you know, if you're just going to correct it all the time, like if you're going to read from an English Bible and then just keep saying, like, this is wrong here and this is translated wrong, like, why don't you just come out with your own translation? You know, just come out with your own translation and correct it if it's wrong. You know, rather than, you know, getting people to read a Bible and then just telling them everything they're reading is wrong. You know, so we don't want that sort of environment in God's house. We want people to be able to read the Word of God in their language and trust what they're reading. If it's wrong, correct it. But you know, the King James Bible has, has, has had hundreds of years of people testing it, and it's stood the test of time. So I just want to see what else I want to mention here. Now, where does this idea of going back to the Greek you know, people think it gives them all this insight. I want to show you this passage, and I think this will be interesting for you. John 21. This is a passage that's always talked about when they say, ah, you see, like, the English doesn't have this meaning, and you can't get it from here, and only if you go back to the Greek, you're going to get the true meaning of this passage, right? It says here, so when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, yea, Lord, thou, love it, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, feed my lambs. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said unto him, Feed my sheep. Now, if you didn't know any Greek, and you think like, okay, why is Peter grieving here? You'd probably think, well, it's, well, it's because he denied him three times. And here Jesus is asking him three times, do you love me? And he's grieved when he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And it's like he's trying to reassure him that he loves him even though he had failed him when Jesus said, before the cock crow thrice, thou shalt deny me thrice. Right? Now I think that is what is going on here. But if you know the real meaning in the Greek, right? The real meaning in the Greek is, well... If you go back to the Greek, when God, Jesus says here, lovest thou me, this love is the agape love. It's the selfless, unconditional love. And he's saying, do you agape me? And he says, yes. And then he says the second time here, lovest thou me, this is agape. It's like, this, that, do you love me with agape love? And he says, yes. But then the third time, he says unto him, phileo. 
right? Phileo is more like a casual, brotherly, friendly love. And Peter, knowing that he's grieved, that it's like, no, I agape you, I don't just phileo you. And that's why he's grieved. So you miss that meaning because you can't get that in the English. You know what I mean? You can't get it. But if that was the case, and he said agape, agape, phileo, and then it's like, well, how did he ask him the third time? Because technically he asked him the first time, phileo. Didn't ask him the third time. If it was the third time, it'd be agape, 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 right? So, how, how do you make sense of this, right? Like, why, why is it different? Is that the true meaning? This, this phileo? So, people had to get this idea, like, there's agape and a phileo. So, now we need to look at how love is used in the Bible, and then we get the true meaning. Well, let's do that. I'm going to give you a test, right? I'm going to show you a passage of scripture, and you're going to choose, and maybe I'll just get a show of hands, whether you think this word in love in the passage is agape or phileo. And we'll see if it's that obvious, right? Let's, let's start with an easy one, right? God commanded his love toward us. Now, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Who thinks agape? Who thinks phileo? Oh, we got some phileos in the audience. All right, this one's agape, right? Yeah, isn't it obvious? Like, it's obviously conditional self-sacrificing love, the sort of love that God has for us. All right, let's look at another one. After that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. Who thinks agape? Agape. Making you a bit shell shy. This one. Phileo. This is a phileo sort of love. Is that, is that, what, what? Which one does God love us with? Unconditional or just a casual one? Oh, well, they're the same thing. You know, they're just synonyms in Koine Greek, you know, and love is the right word that it should be. For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth, and he will show him greater works than these, that ye may marvel. Agape. Phileo. Oh, you mean the Father already loves the Son with a friend, brotherly love? This one's easy, surely. You know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Agape. See, now you guys don't know anymore, do you? This one is actually agape, right? Of course, right? Why can they use any other Greek word? I'll show you a few, but you'll start to see that it's not as obvious as you think it is. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. This is agape. But, Revelation 3.19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. That's phileo, Right? Then she runneth to Peter, but then she runneth, sorry, and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. How do you think this love is when he's talking about John, the disciple whom Jesus loved? Who thinks Phileo? <laughs> You're just guessing now, aren't you? But you guess right, right? Phileo. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Agape. So you mean they, that Jesus loved them more than he loved John? Well, you know, I, I kid because, you know, this one, it's funny because this passage, the disciple whom Jesus loved is Phileo, but if you look up the other ones, they use agape. Agape, right? So, <clears throat> woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, for ye love the uppermost seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplace. I won't get you to put your hand up, but what do you think it is? This one is agape. But if we look into Matthew 23, I love the uppermost rooms of feasts and chief sin seats in the synagogues, that one's phileo. It's like, isn't it the same passage? I mean, it's a parallel passage, right? Just, uh, Forgot to hide this one, but I wanted to hide this one. <laughs> Husbands, love your wives. <laughs> Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Choose wisely, boys. <laughs> Who thinks? Agape. You're right, yeah. That's it, agape, of course. We love our wives with any other love. 
that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. What is going on here? You know, so what? We have to love our wives with this unconditional love. They only have to love their husbands and their children with a casual, friendly, brotherly love. So you see how, like, you know, I got this sort of idea from Sam Gibb. Sam Gibb has this love test. And it sort of just shows the folly of just going back to the Greek and ascribing a meaning that not necessarily could be true, right? So what do we learn from this? That, 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 that is translated right. That there is no, they use the word synonymously, right? And it's just the context has to teach you what sort of love it, love it is, not uh, necessarily the Greek word. All right, so we don't want to put a foreign language above the word of God. All right, I just got three more, three quick ones. Authority, appealing to authority. Sometimes people put an authority figure above the word of God. Oftentimes in Christian lives, you'll maybe hear them say something like, well, I believe this because that's what my pastor teaches. That's what I heard at church. That's what my church believes, right? You know, the Catholic church has made this a fundamental doctrine that they believe the authority, the magisterium of the church above the word of God, right? This is what they've done. But we don't put any authority above our final authority, right? Which is the word of God. And obviously, I appreciate loyalty, right? I appreciate that people stand with me and back me, but you should never put me above the word of God. Look at what the Bible says in Acts 17, 11. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica and that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. So this is what I want you guys to be like. You receive the teaching with all readiness of mind, but then you search the scriptures daily whether those things were so. So you see, you can see the Bible being the final authority in these people's lives because they didn't just accept it at face value because of an authority figure. They tested it by the word of God, right? 1 John 2, 27, look at this, but the anointing, this is the Holy Spirit, but which, which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. So you should be able to learn any truth from the Bible with the Holy Spirit as your teacher. Now, does it help that people can help to teach? You know, you learn from me, you learn from others, you learn from books that you read, articles you read. Yeah, but do you need those in order to learn it, you could learn it just by reading the Word of God. So don't ever put an authority above the Word of God. You have the Holy Spirit in you, you read the Word, it can teach you. You know, you want to put helps in their place under the Word of God. They are helping me to understand what is the final authority, but the final authority is going to judge whether that is a good help ultimately or not. All right? Now, sometimes people may not you know, necessarily look to the bishop of the church that they're in as the authority, but then they might say things like, yeah, but we go back to the church fathers. The church father wrote this, church father believed that. Did you know church fathers are just bishops from earlier time frames? You know, they're still men, they're still imperfect. A lot of the church fathers, when you read their writings, believed in what's called baptismal regeneration. Like they believed that you had to be baptized to be saved, right? A lot of them did. So just because they believe these things, that doesn't necessarily mean they're right. Why? Because they are not the final authority in all matters of faith and practice. So you want some church fathers? These are the church fathers you should have, right? Paul, Peter, James, John. They're our church fathers. Not all the ones that have lived throughout the hundreds of years throughout. It. Now, can you learn some things from them? Yeah, but you should test their articles and their teaching, their sermons, no different to how you would listen to a sermon today from a bishop from a modern day period, even my own. All right, so you don't want an authority, you know, earthly authority to be above our heavenly authority, which is the word of God. Two more. Appealing to the majority. Appealing to the majority. Sometimes people believe things and they reassure themselves and they say, well, so many people believe this. So many churches believe this. So many, they appeal to the majority. Oftentimes when you go soul winning, you know, maybe you'll talk to a Muslim and Muslims will often throw this out, you know, as though it's some legitimate argument and say, well, look how many people are converting to Islam. 
And you know, I highly doubt that the growth rate in Islam is due to conversion. You know, it's probably just them having children, right? But they'll say that. But even so, what does that matter? I mean, does that determine truth? Just because more people have accepted it? You know, in, oftentimes the majority is normally wrong. Right? Look at what it says here in Matthew 7, verse 13. Enter ye in at the straight great gate. Straight here is not uh, S-T-R-A-I-G-H-T, like straight as opposed to crooked. Straight means narrow, right? Like the, like the bass straight, you know, like when they talk about narrow seas and things like that. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. Look at this, and many there be which go in there at. So are the majority of people going to be wrong about salvation or right about salvation? They're going to be wrong about salvation, unfortunately. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Right? So you don't want to base what you believe on the majority, because you hear that argument from a Muslim, right? And you think, oh, yeah, that's not a valid argument. But then, you know, Christians will say the same things. You know, they, they sometimes use the same sort of argumentation. You know, oftentimes when, you know, even in, a, in our circle of churches, when we talk about the topic of repentance, right? And they say, like, well, how many churches believe that repentance is just a change of your belief and believing on Jesus Christ? It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter how many believe. If they've got the wrong definition of it and they're preaching work salvation, I'm not just going to believe that just because more people believe it. Of course more people are going to believe work salvation. My point, my point is not to just then go with the minority. My point is you don't go with the majority over the Word of God, right? Because the Word of God is our final authority in all matters of faith and practice. What should matter is what does the Bible say, not how many people believe it. So that's one thing that happens within churches when it comes to the doctrine. Sometimes people have take comfort in or how many Christians they know that believe it, as opposed to taking comfort because you know that's what the Bible teaches. But I'm just thinking about an example in the world as well. Like the world, you know, when it comes to fornication, for example, how many times, like, people in the world, it's just, oh, you know, everyone just gets a boyfriend. Everyone just gets a girlfriend. That's just what things, ha- that's just how things happen. You know, you don't have a boyfriend yet, you don't have a girlfriend yet. So people say, like, oh, yeah, but it's okay for me to do this and okay for me to act like this and, and okay for me to be in this relationship and be intimate with somebody that I'm not married to. And often they'll say things like, but everybody's doing it. They f- take comfort in the fact that everybody's doing it. But, dude, so what if everyone's doing it? That's not what the Bible tells us to do. So we have examples of like say doctrine but we also have examples when it comes to just worldliness right first corinthians 7 this is what the bible teaches now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me it is good for a man not to touch a woman right so when the bible talks about touching a woman here it's obviously not talking about just shaking their hand or hug patting them on the back right the context here nevertheless verse 2 to avoid fornication let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband so you think about the, how the world teaches relationships. Get together, live together, try before you buy. But who cares how many people are doing that? That's not what God wants us to do. What God wants us to do is we avoid fornication by getting married. Right? Marriage is that first step to an intimate relationship. It's not the end result because now you are tried it and you're happy with it. Right? That sort of thing. Okay? So, majority is not our final authority. What's the last one? The last one is sometimes people gauge association. Right? Association is like what something reminds you of. And sometimes people either believe something or do something or don't do something because of its association. Now, like I'm saying, these things, a lot of these things that I'm talking about, are they, can they not be considered in our decision making? They can be dis- considered. Like your associa- association might determine how you dress, what sort of music you listen to, what sort of car you might drive, what sort of like the way you speak and all these sorts of things, what you do and don't do, how you dress, you know, how you put on your makeup, how you're going to appear to the world is it's, it's an association, right? So, but we don't want to make association the sole reason for why we do things, or the highest reason for why we do something. Um, and there can be positive association and negative association. Say, for example, uh, j- just as an example that I bring up in this sermon, like the, the name of a church, right? We, we name our church, you know, the church in Liverpool. And 
Why did we name it the Church in Liverpool? Well, because when you look at the example in Revelation, this is, this is where I got the idea from. I'm saying this is a, just a precedent we see in the Bible where churches are referred to by location. It's not a commandment. So it's not like every church has to be named this way. But this is where I got the idea, right? Revelation, this is a church in Ephesus. See, and this is like, even when I was trying to think of how to name this church, I'm like, should I use of? Should I use in? You know, you've got the church of Ephesus, the church in Smyrna, church in Pergamos. There's more in. So I just decided whichever one fits the suburb. I think that's why maybe it's of, because maybe it's with Ephesus, church in Ephesus. Church in Thyatira, church in Sardis, church in Philadelphia. But look at this one, the church of the Laodiceans. So this is like, the church is named after what they call the people in that area, but it's still based on a location. 2 Corinthians 1, look, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Tim Timothy, our brother, unto the church of God which is at Corinth with all the saints which are in all Archaea. So you can see that this is how God seems to refer to church. These churches in these locations. This is why we, well, I called this church the church in Punchwell when we first started, and then when we moved out to this Liverpool area, we named it after the city rather than the suburb. So the church in Liverpool. But, um, you know, the, the circle of churches that I came from, you know, there's, there's a lot of controversy about, like, you know, sticking by the word Baptist and, you know, making sure you call your church a Baptist church and whatnot. And, you know, they try and argue it from the word of God, but, you know, ultimately it's not a command what you call your church, right? So really it's about association. You know, do you want, to, do you want people to, to hear a name? You know, you think about marketing, you want to hear a name, you want them to associate it with things, and there can be positive associations or negative associations. And I decided in my life, well, you know, if I'm going to do everything based on the word of God, you know, I'm trying to try and see how God would do it and copy that. Um, but I know, I, do I consider our church a Baptist church? Yeah, because... What do I consider a Baptist church? It's a church that baptizes by immersion. You know, we, we are technically an independent Baptist church, but these labels don't necessarily have to be in the name of the church, right? What people know you by. But that's just an example of association where people will do things based on an association, based on what the Word of God does. But we can see here how the Bible refers to these things. Now, if you do things... If you take positions just based on association, ultimately you're going to have to go back to the Bible to see, well, where do you draw the line? Because you say, well, you know, when we baptize here, you know, I baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you say, well, Pentecostals do that too. Does that make you a Pentecostal? No, I'm not a Pentecostal, but that's just what I believe the Word of God teaches. Right? So am I going to stop doing that because I don't want people to think I'm a Pentecostal? You say, like, well, I believe in one God. Well, the Muslims believe in one God. Am I going to stop believing in one God because the Muslims believe in one God? Yeah, just because that's what they're known for? Where does it stop? You know, my God, am I not going to knock the doors because the Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses do it as well? I mean, maybe they got that idea from the Bible. Right? But am I going to stop doing it just because they think, you know, sometimes I'm a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon? You know, generally they don't because, you know, if you go in sort of just more casual clothes, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses are normally in button-up shirts and ties and, uh, you know, Mormons are always in the white shirt, short sleeve, black tie, that sort of thing. So, yeah, you might not want to go in that so people don't immediately think uh, that you're a Mormon or a Jehovah's Witness. So where does it end? And this is why we should just strive to follow the Word of God, right, rather than, you know, have association. Association should be a secondary consideration, not our primary. All right, so what are some wrong authorities? Emotions, experience, tradition, isolated verses going to a foreign language, appealing to authority, appealing to the majority, putting association above what the Word of God says, what people think of it, as opposed to what, the, what God thinks of it. Right? So 2 Timothy 3.16, we'll just read again. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Now, it would make sense that if the Bible is to be your final authority in all matters of faith and practice, then you need to know the Bible. All right? So that's the thought I want to leave you with today, is how well do you know your Bible? How can it be your final authority in all matters of faith and practice if you don't even know what it says? All right? So may God help us to you know, get in the Word, understand it. Let's not be like that workman that is ashamed, you know, not rightly dividing the Word of truth. All right, let's pray. 
Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you that we have it today. It's at our fingertips. And Lord, uh, it's unfortunate that it's so easy to access that we take it for granted. So, Lord, help us to learn your word, know your word. Uh, help us to have it as our final authority in our all matters of faith and practice. Help us, help us to be wary of these other ways that people put other things in authority over the Bible. And pray, Lord, and help. I pray that you would help us not to do that. So we... Pray that uh, we will learn from this Lord, apply it in our lives, and we pray these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.